really sing out loud. Um, it is cold this morning, but boy, doesn't it seem nice to see the sun? I mean, I don't care if it's, if it's cloudy or if it's sunny. I just feel so much better. And I, as I'm driving up, I'm thinking, there is sunshine in my soul today. Amen. More glorious than life. Um, our announcements and our bulletin, there will be adult Sunday school in the library for the meeting and following, and all are welcome. There will be no Zoom on Wednesday night. Uh, FYI, uh, they weren't sure where they were going to be, whether they'd have internet access in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Thursday, music practice here at the church, and Friday, men's Bible study downstairs at 7.30. Um, Clifton Community Food Bank, not this week, but next, be next Monday, correct? Mm -hmm. Any food delivery or yes? Yes, yeah, we have a pickup this Thursday at 8 o'clock at Good Shepherd. I need drivers. And people can help unload. And um, we also have a ton of um, sandwiches and stuff downstairs from this weekend's pickup at Parity. So everybody's welcome to take what you want. You so in the cooler, mm -hmm. there's plenty of sandwiches and salad, you know, some. Stuff that can't be broken. Yeah, stuff that can't be broken. <coughs> Harry, you and Vern are going to go Thursday. Uh, Vern, I don't want to speak for him, but I'll go. <coughs> Can we drive in Thursday? Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, drive. I'm fine. He's, he's the You're shot. right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's uh, the navigator, so. If he backs me up, I'm yeah. back yeah. Um, you, Gary, I, we were talking before the service about any word from the Dominican, so you said you talked to Tina. I talked to her yesterday. I uh, only got to talk to her for a few minutes. Of course, they're going 100 miles an hour. But she said this morning they're in service, uh, like us. Um, she said she's been scraping a lot of paint and getting services ready to paint. They were going to start painting. That's, that's what they're doing. You know, I, I yeah. didn't, the talk, conversations were very short. Yep, she's doing well. She keeps telling me I'm doing that. <laughs> She'll work on you then, right? I think Judy said she was going to do it. No. Um, any other announcements that aren't in the bulletin? Anything? We had our annual meeting last Sunday. and Nothing? Nothing else? Okay. Well, on that, if anyone wants a copy of the annual report, there are a couple left over, so I know where they are. So see okay. Now, if you, if you read us here, it says where they come up with these names, I don't know. Sugar, sugar Ganger of David, which he sang unto the Lord concerning the words of Cush and Benjamin. This translates that they think this is, this is Cush, which may be related to Saul. So, what David is saying here is persecution that he is talking about being fought in peace of actually saw persecuting. O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. These ye tear my soul like a lion, rendering it in pieces while there is none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, or if there be iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, Yea, I had delivered him that without, that without cause is my enemy. <clears throat> Let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. 
Yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth, and lay mine honor in the dust. Here. Arise, O Lord, in thy anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and await for me to do judgment that thou hast commanded. So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about. For their sake, therefore, return thou on high. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my iniquity that is in me. Now, if you read, if you, of course, all of you know David and what sins that he's done. Yeah, but you, you read this here, it says, O Lord, according to my righteousness. And why is David counted righteous after all he's done? Because he repented with a true heart, which gives us encouragement. And according to my iniquity, that is in it. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God tries the hearts in rain. My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He also prepared him for the instruments of death. He ordained his arrows against the persecutors. Behold, he trailed the iniquity, and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and digged it, and has fallen into the ditch that he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own head. That's head. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Titled The Lord is Holy. Let's stand and sing it.
uplifted after that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here this morning, bless us with your presence. Open our hearts and our eyes and our minds to your message, Lord, to your word, and help us to know how blessed and how special we are in your sight. Be with each one of us. We pray for those that are in the Dominican, Lord, uh, being missions to all areas of the world. We just ask that our praise and worship this morning be acceptable in your sight. And now as we pray the prayer, you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to read a short, uh, we used to, we're not supporting as much now as we used to, but the Peckhams, I know some people still are contributing to them. We've got their newsletter, and I'll share it with you. We already got an update from the Dominican, so... You know, I think, I hope we all are continuing to pray for them down there, for safe traveling, for the work that they're doing. This is from the Peckhams. In November, we finally made our global announcement of this incredible film my team and I have been working, praying, and dreaming about for over 10 years. We brought together local dignitaries and ministry leaders in Seoul, South Korea, Uganda, and at the Museum of Bible in Washington, D.C. to share some of the first images and announce our intentions to relay this amazing film in December 2025. It's the Jesus film. The re response has been overwhelming as we've continued to hear from partner ministries about how they want to use this film to help reach the next generations for the gospel. Though we are still in the midst of producing this film, we wanted to share some early renderings and concept art for the film. The image of Jesus is our look of film test that is our look target for the whole film. I now begin in earnest to meet with our global field leaders to share more about this project and get their feedback and help in creating the best film that will speak to those they minister to. I am so blessed to know so many of them through the work God has led me through in my 15 years with Jesus Film, and we covet your prayers moving forward. So blessed to be serving Christ with you, Michael and Cindy Peckham. There is some art on it, and I, this will be up front if somebody would like to look at this afterwards. Um, quite a project they're working on. At this time, I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward to receive our mic. <laughs>
stewarded to us. We pray, Lord, that these offerings would, would serve your kingdom well here in Clifton and beyond, and that you would bless with, uh, with wisdom the distribution of these gifts for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 May be seated. Um, Sophie, I did hear you singing this morning, <laughs> loud and clear. Uh, I had some people mention to me last Sunday, but I think it was Blessed Assurance, but I'm not sure that she sung right out loudly. So, um, I want to share a song with you this morning. A, a young lady asked me a while ago if I would sing this, and I, I didn't want to think I'd forgotten it, so I will do it. But um, you've all heard me tell the story about how I sang this song, and uh, afterwards a lady approached me in the hallway and, and complimented me on the song, and I go, oh, my voice was terrible, she said, it wasn't well with you about the song. This is the song. But I remember that every time I sing this, I say all the time, I do my best singing in, the, in my car and in the shower, but it's the words of this song, and the song is entitled, I Believe.
Come to the Lord this morning. Respond to greeting from Ephesians. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. But if in, our, if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live in God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Amen. I was told that, I don't like to pick on people, but I was told that Sophie might know this song too. So. Um, 597, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. This is the six verses of this song. As I'm looking at it, I'm going, which verses do we leave out? So what we're going to do is we will sing the first verse, then we're going to read the next two verses together, and then we'll sing the fourth, fifth, and sixth. So let's stand together. We are going to do all six verses.
Oh, I'm sorry. Jumped ahead. <laughs> I made a mistake. <laughs> we were a little Dr. Yeah. So I, that raise is going away now. Herb, would you come up and see this morning prayer? I was wondering who that was. Well, Deb reminded me, or I would have. So, do one. Like we did last week, instead of you telling your prayer to me when Deb done singing, or drunk, Dave is done singing and ended, you pray your prayer yourself. It's more personal and it's from the heart. And then when you're all done, I'll Their neighbors being there to pull them out of the ice as their vehicle went through the ice. 
with my nephew that his family members saw that he had fallen on the ice and had injured himself and that he's been home now and recovering from that. And I also, Lord, that there's been other things going on in our towns, neighbors, and I ask you to be with the Sakara family as they have lost a loved one in a very unusual way. And Lord, continue to be with all of us here as we deal with everything that is happening in our lives and also in our friends and families and neighbors' lives. As we know that the answer is through you, Lord, through your son Jesus, that he died for all of us, Lord, and we need to be compassionate neighbors to all. In his name. Dear yes, Lord, thank you for the little church up on the hill of Cushman and having a place to praise your name. Thank you. And understand me from the presence that we can even come to. And it's the blood of Christ that we can. the God of the universe will hear our prayers. We thank you so much for that. We pray for God to touch her body and heal her. We pray for Lexi, who's been an accident, that you touch her body and heal her. We pray for those in Israel. We pray for soldiers as they fight, that you protect them. We pray for those hostages who be released. Also, we pray for the people, your people, that they return to you and find you as their Messiah. Lord, we pray for our country. We ask that you would uh, look upon our elected officials, the current administration, the future administration, those in the governor's mansion, those who serve in the administrations of the each governor, the senators, and Congress, and, uh, those at state legislature level, and our state reps, and so on, Lord. We ask that you would look upon them, that they would seek after you and find their wisdom and salvation in you, that they would turn back to you, Lord. Our nation is on a a, a downward path, and we do seem to be a nation in decline because of so much sin and immorality. And we pray, Lord, that we would seek after you once again, that you would turn our hearts. You, oh, you're obligated to save none. But Lord, we know that you are merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and allowing in steadfast love. And so we pray for your mercy on our nation, upon our leaders, and upon the people of this nation. We pray for your mercy upon our families. We pray for repentance through and through, that we would humble ourselves, seek your face, turn from our wicked ways, and that you would heal this land, Lord. We thank you, Father, for this body believer. We thank you and praise you, Father, that as a body of believers, as this church, not the building, but as the believers, that people can lift their voices come to you in prayer and supplication, knowing that you hear them and knowing that's from the heart. We do pray for this country, Father, that this evil will be rooted out once and for all. And the righteous in Christ start lifting the voices, defend one another, defend this, this country instead of remaining silent. I pray for my Barb wife, Barb, I pray to be with her. He healed her completely, O Lord, and get rid of this disease. I said to pray for my daughter, who will to keep her strong. We pray for the loved ones in this congregation, Lord, that has a dimension, sickness, or salvation. So seek you first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added on you. So we do pray most of all for salvation. <coughs> Whether we have to go, or they have to go through the tribulation of one month, Lord, whatever it takes. Bring him around and see by something. Thank you, Father, for every one of us here today to fight the cold. But we know sometimes, Lord, that as we get a little weary, fight the battle today, that you argue with yourself, what does it go to church or not? But we know, Lord, that's what's good. That's where our strength, that's where the power is. So we thank you for our Son, Jesus Christ. Who has made all things possible on this earth. Whether we understand it or not, we will not until we see him face to face. Because sometimes we pray and it doesn't come out the way we want. We're the time that we want. So we just 
pray, Lord, that you continue to guide us and keep our spirits up, keep our heart in the word, our mind in the word, and not be swayed by the things in this world. Let us be like that Bible sometimes that just the blinders on and you can't see to the left or right, you just look straight ahead. <coughs> we pray to all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Savior, King, Friend. So much more, so much to go on and on. We thank you for his name. Amen. Now I will ask Dave to come up and voice it. So I thought that was a really, really good prayer time. I mean, uh, I like that format where everyone should participate. I know, I feel, I feel extremely edified. Um, so you're all dismissed. I, I feel like the church is here. That was really good. Well, uh, if you haven't already, why don't you take a minute to greet each other? I don't know if you typically do that, but I did it last time too. It helps me to find my place. So I'll take maybe 30 seconds or a minute to say hello to each other this morning. Sure, it's nice to be indoors this morning in a warm building, isn't it? Yes. Um, why don't we pray? Again. Father, as we get into your word and we continue worship, we thank you for the blessed time together thus far, for the worship that has occurred, for the smile of heaven upon us, and the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace of God through Jesus Christ. Amen has finished atoning work once and for all that has been applied to us by faith. We thank you for loving us. We thank you that you're merciful, gracious, sovereign God. We want to glorify you today. We want to learn from you today. We humble ourselves before you now as I teach and listen, as, as, as others listen. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight this day, my strength and my redeemer. Holy Spirit, fill me, use me, bless the reading and the hearing in your word. May the words that I say simply be, uh, uh, the parts that are not necessary, may they just be washed away from our minds and memories, and would you plant the word deeply into our consciences and thoughts and lives. Lord, we need you today. We look to you. We want to glorify you. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, would you please turn to Matt, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. We're not going to look at the whole chapter, but I'm going to start the first uh, three or four verses. First three verses, we'll skip over to 10 to 14, and then we're going to really... Narrow it in on, on verses 26 to 34. I'll, I'll, we'll go through it together. I'll, I'll walk you through it together. So, In honor of God's word, would you mind standing with me as you're able? Mark chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. And he, that is Jesus, began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. Get that? And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. Skip down to verse 10, please. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, or verse 13 now, Do, not, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And down to verse 26. This is the first of two parables we'll look at today. Both very short and, and related. 26. 
And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how the earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said with, the second parable now, and he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? And it's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make their nests in its shape. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as, if it, as, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. This is God's word. You may be seated. Uh, when I was growing up, speaking of seeds, I'll tell you a little story. My mom would sometimes ask me what I wanted. She's on her way to go grocery shopping. She would ask me, Dave, what would you like? Would you like anything in particular? So I'd always say, yeah, I want some cookies and I like bagels. But if I wasn't specific, she would always come home, not with Oreos or like Chips Ahoy or something, but with something called, and maybe some of you like this, but I hate them. Pecan sandies. You know what those are? <laughs> I'm just not a fan. And then instead of onion bagels, she would come home with these poppy seed bagels or the everything bagels. And I, I don't know, I don't like the taste of poppy seed. I'd sit there and I'd pick out every single little tiny seed and then I'd pop it in the toaster. Now, I was a picky eater. Maybe I still am a little bit. I don't know. I still don't like poppy seed. But, in the, in the short parable about the tiny mustard seed, it really has nothing to do with bagels or poppy seeds. It has to be rather with the Word of God. With the prophecy of how the Word of God uh, would accomplish what God said it would accomplish. In the second parable, Jesus, and that is the one about the mustard seed, uh, starting in verse 30, Jesus illustrates the history of the visible church on earth. It's important to say the visible church. Because today we're going to look at the visible and the invisible. We're going to look at the, the, um, the external and the internal work of the Spirit and of, of the work of grace. But here he illustrates the history of the visible church on earth. From the time of his, of his first coming all the way down to the time of the harvest on that judgment day. And the first parable, though, which we're going to look at in verses 26 through 29... Jesus shows us first the internal and the invisible work of grace, the work of the Holy Spirit. He shows us how the grace of God changes and works within the heart of the one whom God saves. We've all been recipients of common grace. We could all look out at nature. We could all sit out on the beach. We could all climb a mountain. We could all see beauty. But not all of us have had the inward work of grace saving our souls. And he's talking about what the seed of God does, the word of God, as it's planted in her soul. The first parable is only recorded in Mark's gospel. And sometimes it's really nice if you've taught much that you know, like, I think this means that, and I've compared it with that, and I've looked at other scriptures here, and then I went and I checked some commentators over here. But in, in this case, this parable is only in Mark's gospel. There's nothing else to compare it to. But it's important, I think, and I think there's... It's quite an encouragement. It does summon us to examine our own experience in divine things. There's four things that are taught in the first parable. They're simple, they're relatively brief, too. First, that is, that is as in the growth of grain, starting in verse 26, you can see this. Let me reopen my Bible here for a minute. For whatever reason, closed it. The first here is that as in the growth of grain, so in the work of grace. There must be a sower, and in this case a sower of the word. God uses means. It doesn't happen automatically. He uses means. He uses his church. He uses his children. He uses those of us who have been saved out of the darkness into his marvelous light to proclaim the word of God and to scatter the seed, to plant the seed of the word.
The ground, as we probably know, never brings forth grain by itself. What does the ground bring forth? Weeds, not wheat, right? Weeds. We don't want weeds, nor does God. The heart of man, in the same way, will never turn itself to God. Never repent, never believe, never follow Christ on its own. Being created in the image of God, the heart is still fallen, desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it, the Bible tells us? Barren of saving grace. Loved by God, created in the image of God, uh, worthy of dignity and honor and respect, but still barren of saving grace. It cannot, the heart cannot give itself spiritual life. Amen? Amen. Good. I mean, the verses we were reading made that very clear that we are not justified by any works of the law. No work that we can do can ever save a soul, can ever impart grace into the soul. And the soul, the heart must be broken. First broken and mourning over its own sin and breathed upon by God's Spirit. However, saving grace in the heart of man is often not seen. It's invisible. It's not external. It's invisible. It's a new principle. It's a new person inside of us, from outside of us, sent from heaven and implanted within. Thank God for that, by the way. <laughs> I don't know where I'd be today if it weren't for God apprehending me. Secondly here, if you look carefully, as in the growth of grain, so in the work of grace, there is much that is beyond our understanding and beyond our control. There's things we don't know. Listen to these words carefully by uh, J.C. Ryle. He writes this, quote, The wisest farmer on earth can never explain all that takes place in a grain of wheat when he has sown it. He knows that unless he puts it into the soil and covers it up, there will not be an ear of corn in time of harvest. But he cannot command prosperity on each grain or on any grain. He cannot explain why some grains come up and other grains just die. These are matters that he must leave alone. He sows the seed and he leaves the growth to God. Likewise with grace, God gives the increase. In the same way, the internal and the invisible workings of grace in our hearts are mysterious. There's things we just can't get. We just don't know why the word produces effects on one person, but on another person they hear the exact same message, maybe they have a similar upbringing, and it produces no fruit. We just don't understand the mysterious working of the sovereign decrees of God and so on. We sleep. Actually, this is, I think it's pretty humbling for ministry leaders, especially very gifted and charismatic ministry leaders, right? Because even the highest abilities, the most skilled, the most powerful preaching cannot determine success in saving souls or in edifying or seeing people grow in Christ. God alone must give the spiritual life. It has to be Him. Our primary task is what? To be the sow, to sow the word, to sow the seed. As it says in the passage here, we sleep and we rise night and day. We do the work. Hopefully we're doing that work, right? And we leave it up to the Lord to change hearts. Third here, as in the growth of grain, so in the growth of grapes, in the work of grace. Um, it doesn't happen, well, let me put it this way, it happens gradually. Life manifests itself gradually. Like at a moment in time that a person is converted. They go from death to life in a moment of time. Right? But life doesn't always show itself immediately. How many of you know that when you got saved, maybe maybe you your life you were on fire immediately for God. But for, but for many people, when they come to know the Lord, it takes time. There's a gradual process of growth. The work of grace goes in on in the heart by degrees. That thing's going to keep falling over. The work of grace in the heart goes on by degrees, gradually. Believers aren't born with perfect faith, perfect hope, perfect love, perfect knowledge, perfect experience. We all know that. We're all still in process. We're all still growing. But it doesn't make a difference 
Even the weakest child of God in God's family is still a true child of God nonetheless. They are still counted perfectly righteous in Christ because of what he did for them on the cross. Even, think about this, even with all his weakness, he's alive from the dead. Grace really has come alive in the believer's heart. No matter what the maturity level is, even the strongest man was once a baby, but gradually, and this is important, he must grow. Grace won't let him stay a baby in Christ. Grace will continue to provoke. The new nature from above, planted within, provokes and empowers us to grow spiritually. Grace enables friendship with God, fellowship with Him, and active, obedient partnership with Him and His purposes in the earth. And I was so thankful this morning when you read that newsletter. Because what you see there is obedient, active partnership with God. How? By grace. What provokes a person to give up their time and their talents and their treasures and to spend time overseas? Is it the adventure? Well, that's a, it, it, I mean, there's, there's danger involved. I don't think most people do it for the adventure. Hopefully not, right? I believe it's the grace of God that changes a person's heart, that, bring, that brings them to a place where they say, I'm going to give up these things in order to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to these folks over here. And thank God for it. Grace does that. Grace does that. Grace is gradual. Fourth, in the, in the first parable, we're taught something else. There's no harvest until the seed is ripe. How many of you are gardeners? Farmers? So you know a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. I'm a gardener and a really poor one at that, but I try. And of course, no farmer thinks of cutting his wheat when it's still green. That wouldn't make any sense. He waits until the sun and the rain and the heat and the cold have done their work and then the golden ears are hanging down. And then he puts in the, well, we don't put in the sickle anymore, but I'm thinking of the old, in, in, the, uh, in the Bible days, he puts in the sickle, gathers the wheat into his barn. And God deals with his work of grace in exactly the same way in us. With us. He only removes his people from the world when they're ripe and when they're ready. When their work here on earth is done. My, uh, my mother on Monday went into the hospital, into the ER. Her heart rate was way out of whack. She's almost 80 years old. And um, not terrible health, but she's had some health issues. And she's starting to feel the effects of her age a lot more over the last year or two. But we were nervous for, for a day or so. We didn't know what was going to happen. The doctors got her stabilized within about 12 hours. They got her heart rate down. They ran a bunch of tests. They determined that she's got some other things going on there. My mother's a committed believer, though. She's now improving, thank God. But, but while she was there, what I love about my mom is She's always thinking, how can I serve people? How can I witness to someone? So there was a woman there in the bed beside her who was from Romania, a Jewish woman, who had been persecuted for being Jewish. My mom got to lead her to the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. I was so thrilled to hear my mom still doing the work, even at the hospital bed. Not knowing, well, at this point, she probably knew what she was going to make it. But the thing is, there's still work to be done. There's still work to be done. You're all still here, and I'm still here for a purpose. God still has something for each of us to do. <coughs> God has the final say. He only removes his people from this world when they're ripe and ready, or when he's ready, when he's going to come back and take us all at that time. Let's, uh, let's transition a little bit into the second parable. First parable, we see the internal and the invisible work of grace and hearts to save people and bring them into a right relationship with God. But now we look at the mustard seed parable, and that shows us the growth of the external and the visible church in the history of the world. Jesus starts off this parable with a comparison to keep it relatable and simple. I don't know about you, but I like that. <laughs> I need that. 
I need things relatable. I need things simple for me. Put the cookies in the bottom drawer for Dave. Um, that way I can have access to them. So really, really simply here, he says, what does he compare? He compares the kingdom of God with a mustard, mustard seed. So let's start with this. What's the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? Church. Church. Church? And good. Anyone? Jesus Say again? The gospel of Jesus Christ is what it's all about. Okay? Throughout the Bible, and, and there's and there's truth in both of those, but they're not comprehensive. Um, so thank you for answering that way. But if throughout the whole Bible, from start to finish, what when he, we see the kingdom of God, it is the reigning authority, truth, and love of God in heaven and on earth to varying degrees on earth. It is, as you mentioned, it's the gospel. It's the gospel life lived out, and it's lived out especially in community in the church. So you both alluded to certain aspects of it, but it's his reigning authority of Jesus Christ. It's King Jesus ruling inside our hearts. Primarily, this is what it is: our hearts by ongoing faith, repentance, and a, and a bold embrace of taking up our crosses, denying ourselves, and following Jesus daily. It's yielding ourselves to Him, saying. You are king, I am not. It's your kingdom, not mine. It's his authority. Simple enough, right? What's a mustard seed, actually? When I was in youth group many years ago, our youth pastor brought in this, this little thing of all these little tiny seeds and told, them they, uh, told us they were mustard seeds. Well, he was lying. Nobody actually knows what a mustard seed is. And we do know this, though. Um, it was a very tiny seed which grew into a large tree. One rabbi by the name of Simeon ben Chalafa said this. He said, a stalk, quote, a stalk of mustard seed was in my field into which I was wont to climb as men are wont to climb into a fig tree. That's pretty big. Fig trees, as you may or may not know, they grow up to 20 feet tall. And they're very wide around. So it's pretty big. So Jesus is telling us this. He's saying, the kingdom of God is like a tiny mustard seed. In other words, it starts small. It starts weak. According to historians, it also appears that a grain of mustard seed was a common expression among the Jews to know or denote something that was, that was something that was very small or very insignificant or very feeble and weak. In fact, twice in the Gospels, Jesus talked about Faith is a mustard seed in both Luke 17 and in Matthew 17. And he was describing weak faith. It denotes weakness. So our Lord, in his brilliant, wise way, finds a familiar way to communicate a timeless truth with some of its timeless implications. A new truth about the external and visible growth in the church. We read our Bibles, and I believe most of you do, maybe all of you. We know this, that smallness and weakness were defining characteristics of the church, especially before Pentecost. There was, there was a, they were a small group of them, and they were generally a weak group. And I think that should come as no surprise, since no servant is above his master, Jesus tells us, in John chapter 15. And speaking of a master, how exactly did our master come into the world? Wasn't it as a small and feeble infant born in a manger, held in contempt by King Herod without armies, without riches? Well, he was given some, eventually. Without servants, without guards, without any power. Weak. Weakness. Later, even after he had risen from the dead, who were these men that Christ gathered around himself and appointed as his apostles? Think actually when they were, before they received the Holy Spirit and us. Think about what they were like before the, 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 the book of Acts. Weren't they poor and unlearned fishermen, tax collectors, political revolutionaries, and the like on the fringes of society? Weak. Twelve disciples would seem to be the most unlikely people to shake the world for Christ. 
And what was the last public act of earthly ministry of Jesus? Wasn't it his public shaming, humiliation, crucifixion as that of a common criminal? Perceived as weak. He was defeated by the Roman Empire. Weak. That's what you would say about him. What about the divine doctrine? The biblical divine doctrine which the church carried forth from Jerusalem to preach to the uttermost parts of the earth. The same as Paul's, which to the Jew was simply a stumbling block. They couldn't even get it, it seemed so weak. And to the Greeks it was foolishness. Friends, we do know that it was a proclamation that the new, their new leader, excuse me, of their new faith, the sinless incarnate God had been put to death on a bloody cross, a torture device for criminals, and that despite that he was offering eternal life through that cross. And on all of this, and even to this very day, if you go into the Muslim world, all they see is weak, weakness, small, insignificant. You want power. You want control. You want authority. And what they see is weakness. Humanity looks at Christ. Humanity looks at his followers. And especially when they're living out their faith in meekness and humility, they only see weakness. They see the mustard seed. They don't see what the mustard seed grows into, though, do they? Our Lord does give us understanding, but for anyone outside of faith in him, as we read back in verses 10 and 11, the beginning of the visible church, the kingdom of God, prophesied in the parable was hidden from them. It just looked small. It just looked weak. How many of us know that many churches in Maine are also perceived as small and weak and insignificant and hopefully they'll just die off or something. But God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in what? In weakness. In weakness. Paul responds, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The risen Christ. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses. You get this? You see where I'm going with this? I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. Secondly, in this parable about the mustard seed, we learn from Jesus that like the mustard seed, the visible church was to greatly increase. It wasn't going to stay weak. We need to stay weak in faith. Not weak in faith, but weak in, in, in our self-sufficiency. We need in our independence of God. We need to be weak before God, to humble ourselves before God. But the church itself, the more it humbles itself, the stronger it becomes. <clears throat> so we learn from Jesus that like the mustard seed, the visible church was to greatly increase. The grain of a mustard seed, says Jesus, when it's sown, grows, become, becoming the largest of all garden plants. Now, I, I know that this, this rabbi said it grows up to 20 feet, and it's wide around the base and so on, and he was wont to climb in it. And that doesn't sound like the largest of plants, but it does sound very large. Jesus uses the phrase, the largest of all plants. And so let's think about this together. What better than a tiny mustard seed to illustrate to us Christ's visible church throughout the world throughout history? What better? It began to grow rapidly, right there at Pentecost. On that day, 3,000 souls were added as Peter preached the work of Christ, the power of God, and, and, and told people to repent and believe. They came, they repented, they believed, they were baptized. 3,000 souls were added to the church converted that first day. A few days later, in the book of Acts, 5,000 more were added. The church grew wonderfully at Antioch through the ministry of uh, the apostolic team there. And just regular believers for that matter. They grew wonderfully at Ephesus, at Philippi, at Thessalonica, at Corinth, and even at Rome, the, empire, the, the, the capital of the empire. Into Ethiopia, when Philip baptized the eunuch, and he brought the, the eunuch brought the gospel back to Ethiopia. 
into India with the, 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 the Apostle Thomas history tells us by 52 AD all the way to India and there's still a church there to that day into Egypt with, the, with, with Mark where there are still large numbers of Christians to this very day congregations were increasingly planted converts increased and Christianity became firmly established it grew wonderfully when finally this despised Christianity spread over most of Europe, Asia Minor, and North Africa. It was a worldwide faith in Christ. And despite pagan idolatry and repeatedly fierce persecution and violent opposition, it grew mightily and became the professed faith of the whole Roman Empire within just a few centuries. Maybe that wasn't the best thing that it was legalized. But it was. And it had spread to the degree where it was legalized and it was embraced. And then, whatever happened after that, I will leave that to, to history. It got largely corrupted in a lot of ways, as we know. The gates of hell, the gates of hell never have and never shall prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. This is what our Lord had foretold in this parable about the mustard seed. Start small. Starts weak and grows in power and in influence. By the way, the visible church isn't done growing yet, as you know. See, despite the weakness and increasing error of some of its branches and departing from the authority of Christ and His Word, it continues to grow and multiply all over the world. Let me just throw a couple basic, brief statistics at you, if I may. Yeah. I'm a statistics guy. I know a lot of people don't like that. But let me just say this. I'll give you a couple. Biblical Christianity is thriving in many denominations. In Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia. Not so much in, in, in Europe and North America as much anymore. But there are at least still 60,000 people every day become, in the world becoming new believers. 60,000. That's the size of almost Portland every single day across the world. 60,000 people on, on average every day are coming to Christ. 20 million a year at least. According to the Handbook of Christian Belief by Bruce Milne, evangelical Christianity grew at three times the rate of the world population between 1960 and the year 2000. That's slowed down a little bit now since 2000, but it's still more than twice the rate of the, growth of, uh, the world population. Um, in the year, I think it was 1990 or 2000, there were 200,000 missionaries serving cross-culturally across culturally, get that out, across the world, 200 to 250,000. There are now over 450,000 missionaries serving cross-culturally across the world. Many of them, most of them, are non-Caucasian. They're non-American and non-European. Increasingly, Latin America and Africa are taking the lead in the worldwide missions movement planting churches in their own nations and across their own continents. According to uh, the World Christian Database, Bible-believing Christians account for now approximately 10% of the world's population. That's pretty amazing. And that's not even including those who are Believers who are wholly trusting in Christ, like in a Roman Catholic Church, even though we would definitely differ on our views here uh, from the Roman Catholics, there are, there are certainly believers there. Or in Orthodox churches, and they're wholly... And I've had conversations with a couple of these guys. People say, that's not a thing. I lived in Poland, the country, 98% Poland, uh, Roman Catholic, and I meet people and talk to them. And we get down to the nitty-gritty, and at the end of the day, I'd say, who are you trusting for Christ, uh, for salvation? Are you trusting in yourself, your church, or your works? Or are you going to trust in Christ alone? And then we get down to it, and so there's some of them who are believing. That, this, this um, uh, what do you call it? This study by uh, Bruce Milne in the World, what's the name of it again here? World Christian Database does not include those folks. In the um, it does not include those folks. And so despite scandals and works righteousness teaching, despite legalism and idolatry and corruption, and there's plenty of it, the gospel is still making some headway in those places 
while unbelief is melting away. Thank God and praise be to God. Even with all the predictions of skeptics for hundreds of years, that biblical faith and practice will eventually lose its relevance and influence because it's so weak, as they say, the visible church is still seeing gospel expansion by the power of Holy, the Holy Spirit and the promise of God, the promise of Jesus Christ, right here in this scripture in Mark chapter 4 today. It's happening. In fact, we read in Psalms, we read it in 1 Corinthians, we can see it in the book of Habakkuk, we can see it in Revelation, I'm, I'm just thinking of a few different places, I'm sure it's many other places, that a day shall yet come when our exalted head, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall take to himself his power and reign, and put every enemy under his feet across the planet. The earth shall yet be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Satan shall be bound. It will truly happen. The nation shall be our Lord's inheritance. And the uttermost parts of the earth shall be his possession. Be encouraged. Who cares how people perceive us? Small and weak? Be encouraged. God is doing something amazing. And, I, and he wants to continue to do something amazing through us. Today, let's leave this parable with a holy determination never to despise the movement of God. Never to look at it and say, small and weak. I don't like the way they worship. I don't like the way they do. I'm just, I mean, there's a lot of things that we people can say about us. No matter how small or weak, because at the beginning of the church, it itself, it, it itself was very small and weak. And let it be our settled mindset never to despise the day of small things, but rather to obediently and immediately partner with God, his purposes and his plans for gospel expansion. Potentially, be a, be a seed sower. Potentially that one seed could be the beginning of a mighty church or a mighty harvest of saved souls growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ who are then filled with the holy love of God. Potentially it could be here. Potentially it's anywhere. Let's determine in our hearts and settle in our minds to be obedient immediately to partner with God in these things. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you that regardless of how the world sees us, can see us, what matters is how you view us and what your promises are towards us through Jesus Christ. I thank you that all the promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. That if Jesus says the mustard seed will grow, and the mustard seed does still grow, thank you that. I, I, I thank you that you're doing your thing, Lord. You're doing your thing in, in this world. You're growing your church. You're growing your kingdom. You're bringing in souls. You're saving people and filling them with your light and love and truth. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be determined to be part of that process, to partner with you in your purposes in the earth, to partner with you in your purposes in our families and with our neighbors and in the communities that we, uh, that we live in, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for this, Lord. I pray that despite my fumblings and bumblings over my own words, that people would not see me, but they would see the promise of God. They would see the power of Jesus Christ to change lives. And that we would, we would all act on the, on, on the basis of what you say in this passage. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Six sixty nine. Make me a servant. Let's stand and sing together. We'll sing it through twice. It's a very short song.
forgive me as we were singing that. I got lost in what we were singing rather than preparing for the benediction. But may the Lord make us servants in the sowing of, of his word. May the God of hope now fill you with all peace, joy and peace in believing, so that you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may abound in hope. Amen. 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 <clears throat>